So hello, uh, welcome to this, the third installment of the Fall 2021 Sarah Little Turnbull Visiting Designer Speaker Series. Uh, this semester we're talking to designers, artists, activists, researchers, scientists to create a sort of broader conversation about design here at Lehman. Uh, my name is David Schwittick. I'm Assistant Professor of Graphic Design and Digital Media in the Arts Department here at Lehman. And uh, today we're going to continue our discussion of the eye. Uh, but today is going to be a little different. Uh, our guest is going to, with her work, attempt to flip the script on the male gaze and, uh, and also just on seeing and perception. Um, and we're also going to be asking you, um, and Carla, there are many students here, uh, so they're going to be sort of involved in looking at your work and working with it. We're going to ask you all to participate in an interactive experience. So this is not just another Zoom talk. It's you're going to be you're going to actually be working with things, and um, and we're going to be sort of guiding you. And we're for those purposes, we are going to be posting links in the chat. And Carla, if you want to post your links in the chat, or I can I can do it if you want. Uh, just keep an eye out for those. The chat's disabled. Um, aside from us, like we can control it. But um, I do ask everybody, if you have questions, please use the Q&A function. It's down at the very bottom of the, the Zoom uh, application window. We, we love to hear your questions. It, it makes it a lot more interesting rather than just of, have both of us talk to each other, although that's pretty cool too. We want to hear your feedback and get your questions. Your experiences are all very important too. So, so without further ado, I'll, I'll, um, I'll introduce our guest. Uh, our, our guest today is Carla Ganes. She's an interdisciplinary artist based in Brooklyn. And her work consists, uh, or consider, I'm sorry, considers the uncanny complications between grounded and virtual reality, nature and artifice, science and science fiction and contemporary culture. She's fascinated by digital semiotics, as, as am I. And she takes a horror vacui or a fear of the, the vacuum, fear of empty space approach to her artistic practice, taking inspiration from network communication, art and literary history, emerging technologies, and speculative design. Ganes is a regular lecturer on digital art and extended reality. And in March 2019, uh, she was a speaker at South by Southwest. You got in just under the, the wire because now they're <laughs> just made it. Yeah. The South by Southwest Interactive Festival on the panel entitled Human Presence and Humor Make Us Better Storytellers. And she her publications have, have Featured her work include The Creators Project, Wired, Fast Company, Hyperallergic, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, El País, The LA Times, among many others. And in 2015, her speculative fiction was included in Devouring the Green, Fear of a Human Planet, a cyborg echo poetry anthology pub published by Jaded Ibis Press. She holds a BFA and MFA in painting from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and Boston University, respectively. And currently, she's industry professor at New York University. And lastly, you can actually see um, some Carla's work in the Eyes Have It exhibition here in the Lehman College Art Gallery. So if you're on campus, please do see it. Uh, welcome, Carla. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much for being here. We're really pleased to have you. All right. Thanks so much for that introduction, yeah. David. And of I'm course. really thrilled to be here. And hey, everyone. Um, at Lehman College. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And so um, I am going to, I have my screen pulled up, but I want to share my screen. Mm -hmm. And is that sharing the screen? You mm -hmm. see the website? All right. Just yep, checking. I see it. And I've got two screens here. So the chat pulled up, I have the Zoom window. And as David was mentioning today, um, to kind of break up the flow of so many Zoom meetings that we are all so used to now, right? And and there is a level of Zoom fatigue sometimes. I am going mm -hmm. to be including in the chat, as I'm as David mentioned, links so that you can participate with me. Now the first thing I'm going to show is just a video of the main project I'm going to discuss entitled Peeparama. And by the way, I'm sitting in my NYU office and this is a drawing of me <laughs> behind. I spent a lot of time in XR, hence you see me with a headset there. But I decided not to wear my headset for uh this talk. Uh, one of the pieces I will be sharing with you, though, is something called social VR, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it, but it is something that you could experience with a headset as well. Now, let me just press play on this so it will be playing in the background. I'm going to turn the audio down, 
And I'm gonna start with a little bit of a prepared talk. And then from there on, we'll get conversational. Once you all start interacting with the things I show you, if you have questions, you know, we feel free to um, ask your question and David and I can pause our conversation or I can pause what I'm saying to address that. Um, so first though, from Trump Loy painting techniques to synthetic media algorithms, artists have always used skill and science to create illusions of reality. For example, a flat two-dimensional substrate with pigment applies offers the viewer a broad vista through which to travel in their mind. A computer application and a pair of goggles allows a user entry into a 3D rendered world where their brain is actually tricked into believing that that world is real. So the trompe l'oeil painting, and when I talk about trompe l'oeil, um, you know, that's a painting that is illusionistic, that represents three-dimensional space, but it's painted on a flat surface. So the trompe l'oeil painting may be tactile to the hand, but it, tr it, it tricks um, or uses tricks of perspective, and they are illusory, uninhabitable, and they're basically a lie that tells the truth, right? And meaning that they're not, they're lying about the fact that there's a 3D vista in front of you, but it looks truthful. It looks like a representation of reality as we know it. On the other hand, and again, this is showing you right now, this video playing a VR experience I built that you are actually going to inhabit soon. Um, the VR experience is considered unreal, but it is a world that can be traversed. It can be explored. It can be inhabited. So which is more real? And so in the project that I'm going to show you, Piparama, which obviously in its title is talking about looking, about the gaze, I employ a variety of reality extending techniques, including trompe l'oeil, digital simulation, and something called GANs generated imagery. Some of you might have heard of GANs, but that is AI, artificial intelligence. And it's a particular machine learning model where you can provide image data sets and then the AI responds basically and learns from those images that you feed into it. And then it formulates and, and, and um, goes through algorithmically learning from these and generates new images and usually thousands of images. And then you as an artist, you become the editor and I'm just gonna um, stop that now. I actually, this next video playing, I have an avatar called Carla Gann, cross-platform avatar for recursive life action generative adversarial network, speaking to Gans and AI. Anyway, um, the AI generates thousands of images as an artist. You then become the editor, so to speak, and you select these images. And I'll go into how I have used this in the project that I'm going to share. Um, so that's my kind of prepared part. And now I want to jump into some stuff. So I just showed you um, a video representation of Piparama, a series of experiences. But I'm now going to put into the chat this is the first link, and I want to talk a little bit about it. You'll see in the title of the link that it says closed. What does that mean? And if you have opened this link on your own machines, you'll notice what I'm doing right now. You can interact with it. So I'm using a mouse wheel here and just um, moving in and out. Uh, and then you see that there is something called a peephole here, and it's occluded, meaning you're seeing an eyeball looking back at you. And why did I do this? So I produced this piece entitled Piparama for a show that premiered in April of this year. And it was for a platform entitled Feral File. And it has been produced and put together by a digital artist and designer and technologist. And his name is Casey Rias. Some of you might know him if any of you have worked with a language called Processing because he actually is the co-creator of this programming language. He has now created a platform for artists, digital artists, to present their work, but it then goes on a marketplace. Um, I know I can't get feedback in the chat, but uh, hopefully some of you have heard of blockchain and NFTs, right? And so this particular piece was produced for a blockchain NFT market. What that means 
is digital art up to this point is infinitely reproducible. Any of you know, like if you upload something to Instagram or upload something anywhere, right? If, if it's a JPEG, even a video, you can, someone else can download it. And so these digital files, even when you're working on a digital file, you can save it 10 different times and it's always the same file. And so for artists who actually are interested in collectors purchasing their work and they're working with digital media, there's a lack of scarcity, meaning it can be produced forever. So why is it worth any value? With blockchain, it actually is a block of code and a contract that cannot be NFT, which is part of blockchain, refers to non-fungible token. So this non-fungible token, which is assigned to your work of art, cannot be altered in any way. So once that is written into a contract through code and a collector decides they want to purchase it, they own your work of art, that one particular work of art, even if it can be reproduced a million more times, that particular version is connected to this contract and it means they actually own it as something that cannot be altered. The data itself, the file itself is now included in this ledger that is immutable. It's a strange concept. Some of you might have heard of it. Sports stars are now releasing NFTs, baseball cards, all of these th different things. Uh, lots of performance artists as well. So getting back to my work and why you see this is occluded. When I first participated in the show and on opening night, I wanted to speak to some issues people were having with NFTs. They were like, well, if, if it's a JPEG online, you can just download it. So I occluded the view so that people, when they first see the object, as you see here, only see this box. It's a box I've 3D modeled. I'll get into later the inspirations for this box, but um, it's a peep box. There's a whole history of peeping in culture from around the world. And so I occlude the view when you first go to the website, which was an art exhibition. If you decide to purchase the box and here's the next one and I'm going to put this link in too in case anybody wants to just uh, actually pull this up in their browser so if you decide to purchase the box you then get to see what's inside so it's kind of also playing on Pandora's box the whole idea of curiosity and another interesting factor about this and again because the inspiration for this I will get into later, but I'll just say a little bit about it now. It's the 17th century artist Hoogstraten, Samuel Hoogstraten, who created these things called peep boxes and perspective boxes. So if we look through the peepholes, we see that things are coming into perspective. And so, for example, I'll go on this side. And if I look right there, the cat lines up and it looks like it's sitting on the floor and the chair is perfectly kind of aligned. But if I look at it from this angle with the with the wall of the box taken away, you see there's all of this distortion, right? And so it's really playing on this idea that how we throughout history have used trompe l'oeil, have used these techniques to convince people of reality and art. But this, in having that one side of the box open, reveals the tricks of it, right? And that all sorts of different concepts of reality can be an illusion. Now, I want to get into another important part of this project. And actually, I'm going to toggle over for a second to show you the original Hoogstraten. So I'm going to um, bring that into the conversation right now. So that's the original box. And this is showing you people viewing it. Can everybody see that OK? Can you see that, David? OK, cool. And um, so that was my model for this. And again, this is all created using 3D software. And so I modeled this box. Now in the Hoogstraten, we see on the outside, there is this angel and on both sides, there are these two angels. And then there are actually two females painting and the angels kind of sit over their shoulders. And I was very kind of intrigued by that. And so I have this kind of robot uh, angel that I've included in mine from a back view and a front view. And then beneath that, remember I talked about my avatar? This is a representation of my avatar, Carla Gann. 
I'll say it again, cross-platform avatar for recursive life action generative adversarial network. So I play in a lot of game spaces and I, I author a lot of VR content. I also teach VR. And so social VR, for example, VR chat, if any of you might have heard of that, is a place that I inhabit with my avatar. So this is a representation of my avatar as an artist being kind of touched by this angel. And instead of doing it as some kind of digital print or painting, I've actually used it as a relief sculpture. Now, in terms of the interior, looking at the Hoogstraten, you can kind of see here, it's a little hard to see, let me see. You know, I've, I've basically kind of modeled it similarly similarly, <laughs> after his convention of this interior. In the 17th century, Dutch artists were painting interiors all the time. And there was always this kind of, you're peeping through, you're looking into this interior. So I've done the same thing, but this is where AI comes in. Remember I was talking about AI and Gantz models before? So what I've done is I work with this AI platform. It's entitled Playform IO. And I collected through researching hundreds of images. One set of images were based on Dutch interiors from the 16th and 17th centuries. Almost always in those Dutch interiors, you see all these different rooms, but you also often see a woman. She's sewing, she's holding a, a jug, she's doing something, but it's always kind of, you know, the female is the object. And then I also, used another set of images. And this is all to train this AI to learn from it and then spit out its own images in response that are kind of a, a collage of these two sets of images I'm first supplying to it. So the second set of images I used were from peep shows from the 20th century. And so there are, and when I'm talking about peep shows, New York City is famous for peep shows and they were illicit. And so generally they incorporated a woman or someone female identified in a booth and then people would pay to look at that woman. And most often that woman, that female was scantily dressed or not dressed at all. And so peep shows were very, very popular. There probably still are some. I know even in the late 90s, I was in an exhibition in Times Square called No Live Girls, where a group of feminist artists showed our videos in peep booths in Times Square. So I guess that still resonates with me having participated in something like that. So the images you see here are generated from my training that AI on both peep shows, these illicit peep shows that, that were about the objectification of women, they were also a, a kind of what we might call a low form of culture. Like if we're talking about art, we have high and low. Dutch painting, something that is canonized, meaning it is something that is deemed very important in art history, is something from high culture. And I wanted to combine these references of high culture, Dutch painting, Dutch um, perspective boxes were about science and optics. And then peep shows were about objectification, about getting to see something profane. But there are ties between them. And I wanted to really explore that visually. And so you see this, and these were the images that were generated by the AI. Now I then selected images, I increased the contrast and color in some of them so that it would have that horror vacui feeling. That was something that was mentioned in my introduction. So this idea of a fear of empty places. And so it's kind of also represents the hypermediation of visual culture today. And so all of these images are both representing the um, Dutch interiors and also these peep shows. There was a lot of signage, a lot of magazines that were produced that advertise these peep shows. And so all of that just kind of gets mixed into this soup. And that's what you're seeing here. You'll also see that in this, there are several rooms that are represented. So the next part of this project and the other part that the collector got when purchasing this piece from that show I was talking about that I was in is not only do they get to look through the peephole and, um, and also kind of 
in a virtual way get to touch this object. It's a sculpture. It's a virtual sculpture, right? So they get to do that. But what happens if you are then transported into the peat box itself? So now we're going to go to the really fun part. So I'm skipping over to this next one and I'm going to put this link in and hopefully this will load on everybody's computer. So um, if you can click on this link, it works best in Chrome or Firefox. And then I'll talk a little bit about this. I'll get to the entrance. You should come in about right here. Oh, I see some people coming in. Yay. And if you're hearing music and that is a little difficult um, because you're also hearing me talk, you can, I'll slow down and do that again. At the bottom right corner, there are three dots and you can click on preferences and then you can go to media volume and just turn that to zero. So you're not hearing the, the music that's playing. So you can still hear me. Is that working? Seven people are in here. Awesome. I don't see any of you yet, but I'm sure I will as I keep going. I mean, you can just be moving around. Yeah. And the way to move, most of you probably know this, are WASD, just like any game you play, and um, keyboard game. And then if you want to fly, just press G on your keyboard. And now I'm going to fly around. And so now we are actually inside. Hi, David. Nice hey. to see you. <laughs> What's up? Um, and I'm just moving around in here. Um, and so again, now what I've done is basically that peat box that we saw, which was trompe l'oeil, it was full the eye. We got this sense that there were all these rooms by using tricks of perspective. Now we're actually in all of those rooms. Yeah, hello. Crested Duck, how's it going? <laughs> you also can chat if you want to. I've um, muted myself. Um, I think you all are muted anyway, but sometimes if you don't mute yourself on this and we're on Zoom, there you can get a, an echo. So if I'm echoing, you might want to just press the mute button there. Yeah. Um, all right. So this is not a game per se. It's really more just an experience. Hello, Common Mergetson. And um, it's an experience. It's a way to um, enter and think about yourself in a different context. When we were looking at the peep box and peeping through the peephole, we were the voyeur. We were getting to kind of subjectify that experience or objectify that experience, right? And we were looking through that peephole. We were kind of outside of it, looking in. Now we're inside. And if you notice, my point I'm kind of making is then if we go outside, we see the eyes are now looking at, in at us. And so now that is when I start to contemplate about the internet today and about the way that we live in a culture that is rooted in history, rooted in, as we see, 17th century perspective boxes and peat boxes. And there were many more across the world, across cultures and nations. But today with the internet, that still exists. You know, we go to certain sites, we find ways to get in. Sometimes they're password protected or you have to join those kind of things. And a lot of the times those are sites where we're getting to look at something. We're getting to see something that we otherwise wouldn't be able to. But the other thing is to think about with metrics, with social media, with AI, with all these emerging technologies, we are also being surveilled. We are inside the peat box and we are constantly, based on the data that is accrued about us, being surveilled, being watched, being followed. And so this is that kind of flip of the script, as you mentioned, David where yeah. I'm now creating an experience that should be fun too. I want people to have fun in this, this box, but also to think about now, oh, what does it mean when I'm inside of the peat box? Yeah, you know what this kind of reminds me of, like an analog to this is, <clears throat> you mentioned Zoom fatigue before, which mm -hmm. I think like everybody has their own definition of now that's, and we're very, they're very close in definitions. We all get it when we hear the, the term. But for me, I think the thing that really did it when, when the pandemic first started was for the first time, 
in a meeting, right, with colleagues or with students, every everyone's looking at me, right? And everybody else in the room, the virtual room is aware that they're being looked at too by everyone else. Right. And that's not normal. That is not like real life. And it's draining. Yeah. Right? It's really draining. And I I, I um because you're constantly worried about your facial expressions, your mm -hmm. body language, you know, um, the lighting. All, you know, or I mean, that's like at the best of times, that's what you're worried yeah. about. Lots of people are, you know, some people are like asleep, but you know, like, but it's, it's, it's draining in a way that I, I don't know. I mean, I think that that really gets to one of the main major challenges with this kind of, this kind of technology as we go forward, right? Humans don't have a place to hide. It's almost like you were also just saying that, you know, we're being surveilled constantly and we're not just being surveilled through the traditional means like cameras, uh, surveillance cameras, right? Um, but we're also being surveilled through just information we freely provide, like what we buy online, what, where we mm -hmm. click in our browsers. And, and big tech is using that not only to watch what we're doing, but to predict what we're going to do next. Yeah, and, it's and through almost our like, search histories, our keystrokes. Yeah. The other day I was having a conversation with someone offline, but I was holding my phone in my hand. And after yeah. the conversation, I'm getting ads for the thing I was talking about. And, exactly. and it starts to make you feel <laughs> very self-conscious too. And and in terms of Zoom, I mean, body dysmorphia cases and have been on the rise. I mean, there's been a prevalence of people getting plastic surgery after seeing themselves for a year and a half on Zoom calls and being unhappy with their face or, you know, all wow. of these things. And it's really strange, you know. And, um, you know, as a teacher, who teaches these technologies, we spend a lot of time in social VR. I build, I have all sorts of different classrooms. Some of them are outside where we could get away from just having the camera on our faces and we could be these strange different avatars. Hopefully some of you have changed avatars and learned how to do it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, I, I mean, for one, many of you students, I know this has just always been your reality. Technology, screens, this is all you've known. And so for someone who's older like myself, I'll say, oh, it doesn't seem normal because I remember a time before this, a time where our technologies weren't as invasive. And again, I'm somebody who works with all of these technologies. I love working with these te technologies, but I think we have to think about the steps that we're taking and the implications and kind of playing four dimensional chess. What could the ramifications be? And even the fact that I'm participating in AI, one of the reasons that I felt it was important as an artist and an educator to participate, to add, even if they're small data, data sets, you know, to these learning algorithms, is because there is so much bias in AI. A lot of times it's a group of engineers, it's a group of people who represent a kind of uh, single dimension <laughs> uh, of, of um, what is the word I'm looking for? Well, a single dimension of, of, of a person, right? And, um, and so it's really important that, you know, it's more intersectional, more people are getting involved and participating in these machine learning kind of yeah. algorithms. Yeah. That's another thing I was gonna mention too, in terms of like participation, you your caveat which is the caveat of every digital designer ever right because mm -hmm. we're, we're it's incumbent upon us to increase participation um through technology right but your mm -hmm. your caveat was you know it works best in chrome and firefox right which is like what else is new although ironically i find i can't use uh, blackboard in either of those and i have to use safari so just you know go figure but so yeah but my, my point is that browser compatibility is in some way it determines participation right so like going into the future who gets to be part of this digital virtual world who gets to have an identity is partially dependent on the technology that they have at home and that breaks along, you know, socioeconomic lines pretty much right. like everything else does in this country at, right. at any rate, which I think is fascinating and scary. So, you know. I, I do too. I see something in the chat. Was that from you, yeah. David? Okay. No, this is from a, uh, a colleague. Oh, Jonah. Hi. Yeah. Um, I figured you knew him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
hey there. <laughs> so the, I've heard that NFTs are kind of dying out now. The hype bubble seems to have burst. Within this space, how do artists get around, um, get around paying expensive gas fees to put work into the NFT marketplace? Do they need to partner with an institution, a gallery, or art org to cover those costs, or should they expect to pay out of pocket? Yeah, um, that's, that's a, a really question. great question. And so one thing, Jonah, is you were right. There's been so much hype. I mean, anybody who's on Twitter, if you're in a certain bubble anyway, if you participated a little bit in the NFT market or you're a digital artist, your feed might be kind of overtaken with NFT chatter. And I have been in quite a few curated shows, both Barrel File, uh, Transfer Gallery. I'm in something on First Dibs right now. And I really appreciated being in the curated shows just because those gas fees, which can be really um, enormous, and just some of the you know legwork that one has to do to mint their own work, a lot of that is covered by the curators and the team that are putting together these shows. But I also have wanted the autonomy to explore that space on my own. And one of the other issues with ETH-based systems, for example, are those gas fees. So I have been minting my works on Hick at Nunk. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but it is a Tezos-based platform. Tezos is another form of cryptocurrency. And one thing about it is there are two different ways of, of mining, you know, like the proof of stake, proof of um, work. And they can be very, in terms of energy consumption, this has been one of the other issues about blockchain and particularly NFTs is the with the data mining that um, that kind of energy consumption is actually a threat to our environment. And we are facing this precipice right now in terms of climate change. And the one thing that I like about the Tezos model is one, it's very inexpensive to mint, by the way, so not high gas fees at all. So I highly recommend trying Hick at Nunk if you want to mint something of yourselves and just try out like that market. And it's and it also there's a community of artists who support each other. I really like that. Um, and then too though, uh, it's a green NFT, you know, and it's greener. And so I feel, you know, we were talking about engaging and working with all these technologies and applying ethics to our practice or really thinking through the ramifications of the technologies that we use, produce, or build. You know, one thing about Tezos is it is a green or a more green, you know, platform to use. And I know ETH is they are currently working on um, ways to uh, to lessen the energy consumption of the process too. All right. Any other questions from students, audience? Or David. <laughs> well, I mean, I also wanted to talk. I just got in front of you here. I was just coming to find you as you were talking. Oh, yeah. Oh, hi. Uh, virtually. Oh, we're in the Marcel Duchamp room, by the way, right now. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. I thought so. If anybody I knows that famous, yeah, in Philadelphia. Yeah, it, this was in his apartment, right? Like he built yeah. this. Scene. He worked yeah. on it for years. Yeah. Yeah. His final, uh, his final trick to the whole world. And it's so two peoples. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, I, I, I actually thought we could talk about the work that's in the, the Lehman Art Gallery show too, because that that's all about representation and, and the self and, and how we sort of, because now we're starting to talk about how we, we provide, we feed the machine that surveils us. You know, it's, it's not like this externalized uh, evil, like in 1984, where, you know, there's telescreens and we're being watched. We're actually, we're providing the information, like not even freely we're doing it happily like we love it like we're that's our form of culture now is right. providing information about where we are what we look like whether we're happy or not what we bought right it's in our instagram feeds with location data it's on you know it's in our biometrics on our watches mm -hmm. uh, all this information is being fed and machines are reading it and they're learning things about us but the selfie is like one of the things i remember being one of the first um I don't know how to put this like a paradigm in 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 online culture this idea of taking a picture of yourself I remember you know nowadays it's common to do this but I remember when I when I was growing up you know um not to date myself but I you know we didn't have digital cameras we certainly didn't have them in our, our pockets and I started like I became an artist taking photographs that's what I love to do is with photography when I was like eight since I've been eight right and I never would have thought to take a picture of myself and I never would have thought to say like have pictures of myself in my room or something like that right like it's just felt it felt very um 
it felt very like vain to do something like that. And it just wasn't done. Like I'll have pictures of my family of things that I like, but not of myself. But nowadays I feel like that's all it is. Like an Instagram feed is just selfie after selfie or some variation of that, so, which is, it, it's shocking to me in some ways, but your work kind of meditates on this idea, right? And turns it on its head. So could you maybe talk about this work and then what your thoughts are on the selfie and, and the selfie series that you've done? Yeah, so um, I just pulled up uh, the entire series and I'll tell you mm -hmm. a little bit about it. And then the work that is in the show is actually the final selfie drawing that I produced. And this work began in the fall of 2015 and then culminated with an augmented reality artist book and a solo show at Transfer Gallery where I, I translated these works into 4K videos and also, as I mentioned, augmented reality experiences. And so these are all the drawings and um, I'm just scrolling down here to kind of get to the beginning. And here we go. So the first drawing actually is very similar to the last drawing. And so this was the first selfie drawing I, that I took. And a little bit of background on that. Like you, David, I became really fascinated with selfie culture. But one thing different is that when I was a kid, we didn't have digital cameras, but we had I had a Polaroid, for example. And I was also a, a developing artist and you know, really interested in being an artist, at least, you know, when I was a, a young child and then teenager. But also, you know, there were fashion magazines. I saw women represented right. all the time. And so I started using my Polaroid and taking portraits of myself. And then yeah. as I developed my painting practice, I did lots of self-portraits. And then for years in my digital-based practice, I would use myself in lots of my work. And generally, I didn't think of them as self-portraits, but I, I thought of myself as kind of casting myself because I was the easiest person to work with as a player mm. in you know whatever particular mise en scene that I was producing as a digital work. And so it came more naturally to me, I think, to then start to develop this selfie series. But the difference was the speed in which they were shared and the amount of people, people you don't even know who you share them with. And it makes me think of Hedo Styrals, the In Defense of the Poor Image, where she talks about JPEG. She talks about the nature of images and their consumption and their, the speed in which they move across internet pathways, right, and across network cultures. And so the selfie became really interesting to me because unlike a painting I would make of myself or a work of art that I would make, including and incorporating myself that would be shared in a gallery context. The selfie was something that was outside of art as well. It was just something right. part of popular culture. So I started right. to make these drawings. I'm checking the time right here. Okay, I'll try to speed up. Oh yeah, we're thing. fine. Yeah, okay. no, no, it's fine. And so that first selfie drawing I made, I was actually visiting my grandmother who was 98 at the time, about to turn 99. And I was really thinking about, this was a woman who was born before women had the right to vote in the United States. This was a woman who grew up in the mountains of North Carolina, the Appalachian Mountains, and didn't even have electricity as a child. And here I am, a digital artist in New York, you know, working with all these technologies. And so I started making portraits of her, and then I turned the camera on myself, and I took photos, but then I was like, what would happen if I slowed down that process? And it generates from a photo of myself, but then I draw it. And then though, for it to be a selfie, I started sharing it on every social media platform that I was signed up for. And so as soon as I'd finished the drawing, I would share it. And so I did this for 52 weeks, and it culminated with this final selfie drawing um, right here, Powers of 10, which I actually completed, um, I finished all these drawings over 52 weeks, and then I uh, published a book and spent 52 more, 52 more weeks using something called augmented reality. Anybody who knows Pokemon Go, that's augmented reality, where that each one of these images would then generate in your iPhone, I'll show you what the one for this is, a 3D expression. So a kind mm -hmm. of expansion of the themes. Right. And when I finish this um, piece, I'm actually using these lyrics about from Momus, this musician who writes right. about an Appalachian mountain girl, a digital mountain girl. And my grandma, Pansy May, who was 101, passed away right after I finished this last piece. And so this whole work is kind of dedicated to her and dedicated to 
you know, a, a kind of female spirit. And also yeah. uh, the exhibition where I showed these works as videos, Transfer Gallery, I titled the show as Subject Self-Defined because it's also a, an exploration of woman as subject. And where I and many young people who are taking selfies today, but particularly females, where females get to determine their own agency and how they represent themselves. And so no longer being the object, but being the subject. And I'll mm -hmm. stop there. <laughs> well, that's that's actually really interesting because maybe that's one way to look at selfie culture. It's as a form of agency and, you know, instead of being the observed, a, a person can take that observation and make it themselves and then self-publish. It's kind of a, it's kind of of a piece with the democratization of the internet in general, which which brings me to another quick off off subject, which why Momus? Yeah, I'm just wondering, are you you said you use Momus for the that is so funny. I, yeah. yeah. And it's a song from 1998. Uh -huh. And again, yeah, it's I 90s really, music. Yeah. yeah, I really identify with my Appalachian culture, my, my grandparents okay. and all my family from my mother's side are from the Appalachian mountains and um, folk ballads. My grandfather made instruments, banjos, violins that he got fiddles and dulcimers. And they sang these lonely, sad ballads, usually about some woman getting killed on a mountaintop by some right. man who is in love with a richer yeah. woman. And um, so all male, of that, yeah. yeah. And um, and yeah. so I grew up in, you know, that culture. I, I lived in the middle part of the state of North Carolina, but I spent much of my time either visiting my family in the Appalachian Mountains um, or even participating in things. My grandfather would, would travel the folk circuit selling his instruments. And so Momus, and it, it was, you know, a 90s song and, and yeah. Uh, also kind of, you know, tongue in cheek, but I love that he wrote a song with the lyrics, Appalachian mountain girl coming home to me. And then she becomes a digital mountain girl. And I so identified with those lyrics yeah. and I saved them and put them into this piece, you know, 20 the, years the later. Reason, the reason I asked 30 years like, later. Yeah, he's like, he's the oldies now, right? Yeah. The reason I, I asked was because I remember moments in the nineties, he was actually one of the, I think he was the first musician to ever crowdsource a song and crowdfund an album. And the way he did it was, it was an early say, you know, it was the internet, but he, it was just like the first few years of the internet. Mm -hmm. There was no social media, right? There was there was no Facebook or Snapchat or TikTok. And the way he, I think he, it was done through uh, his, his website, his fan club. Mm -hmm. He actually solicited money from fans and they paid him money uh to to then put his he then wrote their names into his songs and he put that on the album and that's how he funded the album and it's just so it's like it's come full circle because now that's actually pretty common for people to crowdfund things and uh you know but i just think that that's i would i had to ask um but somebody wants to hear momus music so what i'll do is i'll just uh yeah m-o-m-u-s yeah m-o-m-u-s and i'll i'll put some um yeah, I'll put I'll just put like a, a, a link into the chat and you yeah. guys can hear it. I, yeah. I mean, it's not it's the 90s, man. You know, I love like, Romus. I went to see him yeah. at Knitting Factory and I was actually in a video show with him uh -huh. and he was showing uh, work because he did some gallery shows back then, too. And I was showing some video pieces, but I actually used some of his music for that show that night. And I yeah, I've, I've, I was a big fan. And I think it yeah. was really prescient, the crowdsourcing and the things he was doing. Back I think then. so, too. And, yeah, I have yeah, to I feel like I have to mention it because it's like yeah. now that that wouldn't even we're talking about NFTs and we're talking about virtual experiences where everyone takes part and it's or, or you know, it just seems so it's like what well, he was one of the artists that set like a, the, he set some precedent there. Yeah. And I think it's, we have, sure. uh, there's a, there's another question uh, from the audience. Firstly, firstly, I love, love, love your work and these ideas you're exploring. It's so exciting. How much of your work is created exclusively by you or is any of it produced? And I know you did mention some of this was produced by programmers, et cetera. How much of it is produced, directed by you and executed by programmers, et cetera, to help these, bring these ideas into virtual reality or is AI your only collaborator, Collaborator, which is an interesting statement in and of itself. Yeah, yeah. And as a traditional artist, the learning curve is intimidating in terms of wondering what is needed software and hardware to create in these spaces. So I was thinking maybe you could provide some advice on that. 
Yeah, Robin, thank you so much. And that's a great question. Mm -hmm. And I do work with studio assistants. Um, and right. there have been projects that I've worked on where I've hired people to assist me. Um, also, I am not a, I studied music, but I do not in any way consider myself a musician. So oftentimes I work with musicians to compose yeah. pieces for me or soundtracks. And right. then there have been some games and VR experiences, one particular one called Wonder Camera, where I had um, a developer working with me on some of the back end programming, because there is a point, I work with these technologies every day and I've been doing it for about 20 years, but there are certain times where it's not even, can I do it, but do I have time to do it and get right. the other things I'm doing? Because uh, a lot of times I have yeah. many moving parts to my project. So for example, the selfie drawings, all of the AR, I did all of that myself, but then other aspects of the project, I definitely worked with studio assistants. Usually uh, I can't afford a lot of studio assistants. I'm not Jeff Koons, I don't have a big factory or anything like that. So usually it's one person um, coming to work with me, you know, 10 hours a week or something, but that is a big help. So that's a really great, yeah. great question. And then AI, um, I do like the way that you recognize that it is a collaboration. I used to describe the pivot I made from studying painting, getting two degrees in painting, and I made oil paintings. I mean, I was old school, right? And I still love the act of painting, but that I pivoted to working with digital technologies. And I used to kind of make this analogy, oh, well, the computer is just another tool. But with the way that computers are developing, particularly AI, there are different ways that we're working. When, you're, when your tool starts to learn from you, that's something different than, you know, a paintbrush or, you know, inert, you know, pigments. And so also your technology is always changing. There are new applications. And that's something I know that feels daunting. But I kind of find my way and swim through things by having ideas first. And that's something that I really emphasize to my students too. Just learning a program from A to Z, I don't think makes sense. I think no. that you can learn the basics of a program because you don't know what you can do until you learn the basics or look at some work right. produced with a certain program. But before doing A to Z, have an idea because that's what these technologies need. If there's a dearth sometimes of new technologies being produced and the the people or technologists who are using them don't have fresh ideas or ideas that are really about our humanness, really about, you know, these important ideas about what's happening in culture today, even subversion. I mean, I definitely often use technologies to subvert their original kind of um, meaning or their original, you know, kind of objective, right? And so I think that's really important as artists, you know, we don't have to know everything. There's no way to know it all right now. So really come to it with ideas first, and then you kind of find your way. Today, you know, tutorials are ubiquitous. And so you're like, oh, I want to make this move to here to here and like start searching, you know, and reaching out to friends, who you know, who are working with digital art um, practices. And, and then you can kind of grow from there. I, hope that's uh, I, I want to ask one more question. Um, it's kind of a big question, but it's, um, you know, you were, you are kind of talking about the peep box and, and peeping is almost like ownership. You know, even in the earliest days, it was like a way to have ownership over a woman's body or a woman's image, at least, right? Plays very much into the concept of the male gaze in the lowest form, right? Um, but it serves like a it serves like a biological need, right? But then the peat box, like in uh, I think this was like soon after with like the zoetrope and and other technologies, the peat box became motion picture, you know, peat box where you could you know I forget the term, but you put like a, a penny in or a quarter in, and it plays a small video, and yeah. those became sexualized as well, obviously for decades. And they were like in Times Square up until the 60s, right? And and um, then, you know, the questions arose of like, well, who are they, these women? And are they being paid equitably and fairly? And that led, of course, to the the industrialization of pornography and some some a little bit of agency for the women who are appearing in these, you know, hope, you know, it, it slowly led to where we are today, 
which is just a multi-billion dollar industry, right? That's fed yeah. by the internet, but it has professionals in it, right? Uh -huh. um, this is, I, I kind of see this as like the next step has been, especially in the pandemic, it has gone from the traditional, let's say like the, uh, if we want to call like the pornography industry, the salon system, right? Like the old school, I, I would, I kind of see like Instagram and Snapchat and, that, and then those pointing to things like OnlyFans, like technology, like OnlyFans where it's monetized, right? As being like the next logical step, right? That, that now, and, and I, I feel like overall it's a positive thing. Like women, instead of just being without agency and just being objects can kind of monetize and, and mm -hmm. create a business out of this, which mm -hmm. is, I, I'm all for it, right? I think that's great. Right, for sure. Uh, as, yeah. So my my concern, though, is that we're becoming more and more as we become more digital, we're becoming more and more just consumers of this stuff. Right. And 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 that means like passive, like strong, very passive consumers. And I don't know if you saw this article. Uh, well, it's a story, but it's in The New York Times uh, just last week uh, on a I don't know if everybody saw this. I'm going to put this in the chat. It's really disturbing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. On a on a Pennsylvania commuter train last week, a woman was sexually assaulted, and that that eventually led to her being raped on the train car. And there were multiple people around just watching. Mm -hmm. And um and and I just found out actually today that not only were they watching, but many were filming it with their phones because we all have these things in our pockets. Mm -hmm. uh, last week we spoke to Dennis Delgado. We talked about the phone and and ha everyone having cameras on them and you know how in some ways it can be a good thing because if you know for like the death of george floyd or ahmed arbery aubrey or philando castile mm -hmm. without bystander evidence we wouldn't have anything right and the police that perpetrated the crimes would not have been caught and, or and tried and convicted uh which is the usual right that's business as usual uh, but it, we have evidence and that's a great thing here it's it's almost like flips the script it it's and it kind of reminded me of this uh, the Kitty Genevieve story from the '60s, where she came home to her house in Kew Gardens and and uh, she was followed home by someone early. You know, it was like two thirty in the morning, and she ran around the the courtyard of her building for like a half an hour screaming, and apparently like uh, upwards of like forty people in the building heard it and did nothing. They didn't call the police, and she was eventually murdered. Right, mm -hmm. and it's led to this thing called the bystander effect which is now like 50, over 50 years old, right? 60 years old now. But I feel like this story on the, the Pennsylvania commuter train kind of brings it back that we're still living in a culture where the bystander effect can take over. And I guess my question would be, do you think that all this technology has possibly accelerated this bystander effect or, or is there a danger of it becoming you know, as rare as it might be, is there a danger of this coming becoming more common where we're just passively consuming real life as if it were an illusion? Yeah, um, when you were talking about this incident, I felt like I was listening to a description of a Black Mirror episode. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and yes, Maria just mentioned that mm -hmm. technology is slowly taking over the real world and dehumanizing us all. But yeah. It's another way I, of putting it. I think it, yeah, it, a yeah. succinct way of putting it. And I think that that is frightening. I think that we, since the beginning of recorded history and when polymaths in the you know, 13, 14, 15th centuries were starting to, it was actually a Greek mathematician that first created the first robot. Leonardo da Vinci created a, an automaton, a knight. So I think we've had or we have set a trajectory towards this technological age for many centuries. And, and right, of course. even the idea of the bystander effect was something that occurred prior to the digital technology that we have at our hands today. What is alarming is that people then started, I mean, it's alarming that people didn't do anything. I mean, just how desensitized yeah. can you be? But then that right. becomes content for consumption and who knows where yep. they might've shared that as well. And that is alarming. But I think that we 
should be thinking about the technologies that we produce and the fact that it is highly unlikely, unless the entire grid goes down, that we are going to go backwards. So how can mm -hmm. we go forwards and think about how technology can rehumanize us? For example, there's a tech ethicist who I often have come to my class to talk about these very issues, and his name is David Ryan Colgar, and he started a group, and they all are about HX, so UX design. I have many students who want to go to, into uh, user experience design, for example, but he's talking about human experience and how we can, again, he runs a group about, um, I'm forgetting the name right now, but it's human-centered, right, and about like our taking steps and making efforts to not go full tilt dystopia and that we have that agency, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's yeah. Rainbow's End by Werner, Ven Werner Vengey. He wrote it in 2006 and he kind of predicted something that has come to pass and the fact that with augmented reality technologies and mixed reality technologies and even with just current politics and our polarization that people start to construct their own realities. Again, this is historic, but constructing them in such a way now that they are so believable visually to us, right? And and through all these different senses, and we start to just live in those bubbles on social media and these kind of things, and we're all living yep. again in these kind of bubbles. And and that polarization, that atomization is really frightening. So it takes yep. people to be activists. It takes creative technologists, artists, designers to actually step up, form coalitions and set the future on a different course. Because the technology, I, I really don't think that things are going to no. slow down. There's Moore's Law. But I do think that we can set new trajectories that are more about thinking about human experiences and foregrounding those. And so it's not just the technology is taking over, there's a certain kind of human interaction with technology that is taking over that we need to curtail. That's excellent. Um, thank you for this. I, I, I'll, I will leave it there because I know you oh, have yeah. to go. And, I have to go you teach. Have to go, <laughs> you have to go teach now. Uh, it never stops. But um, thank you so much, Carla. It was, an, I mean, I think, I would love to speak more and more about this and perhaps we'll have another discussion later. Um, but thank you again. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for attending. Thank you to the, thank you to the Turnbull foundation for supporting us and letting us have these, these talks. Uh, really appreciate it. Everybody have a good day. Thank you, Carla. And I'll, uh, I'll talk to you later. Okay. Y'all have a great day. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye.